So um, great. So we've had two great sessions so far. Um, so um, and I think they've complemented each other extremely well. Mark is talking about value chains and the need to be able to link data in, in at different scales. John has then come in and, and given us a really thorough uh, introduction to national material accounts and what you can do with them. Um, and so our third speaker is, and I, I may get your surname wrong, Raymond, I always do, but uh, Raymond Bleischwitz. Perfect. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. So we've known Raymond for a, a, a long time, and um, Raymond's going to talk about what else you can do with national material accounts, but, but from a different perspective and a different modelling approach, approach using macroeconomic modelling, which complements the work that uh, John's been talking about and also the work that Marcus has been talking about. So I'll come off screen and camera, Raymond, and only come in uh, if, um, if I feel we're, we're getting close to time. So over to you and many thanks for uh, joining us today. Well, thanks indeed, Peter. Uh, thanks also to Fiona and uh, also to Marcus and John for making such terrific contributions to our journey on measuring the circular economy this afternoon. Our next stage is the world of macroeconomic modeling. And I would like to just talk you a bit through of what the purpose and some potential limitations of macroeconomic models are. Then I would like to introduce a model that we are running at UCL. Uh, together with uh, Alvaro Calzadilla and with Matthew Winning, and then indeed make a few suggestions of how we could improve and then make together an impact on policies and, and on, 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 on shaping a circular economy. So bear with me for a second. I'm now doing the screen sharing here and start my presentation. So it is really about macroeconomic modeling. And you will probably all have heard the saying of all models are wrong. And you may or may not agree entirely about those um, implications and those sentences. And the last one here has been made by Tim Jackson from Surrey University, who has his own model and his own view on how a circular economy could be organized. But people also agree, and I would like you to take uh, it with me, that um, some models are actually useful. And why is that the case? Because policymakers and others, stakeholders, are asking what is the size of the cake of a circular um, uh, economy? And indeed, for this question, you need a macroeconomic approach that is able to identify not just the winners in a certain product innovation area, but also the potential losers in terms of jobs and growth, the uh, the economic interactions across sectors and across a range of economies and the sectorial changes that we are heading towards like the IT revolution and all those structural changes. So typically macroeconomic models are then used to develop policies and uh, make impact assessments of those policies to exercise responsibility in the short and in the long term and to offer choices is a certain policy mix better than another one? What are the real costs and for whom? So those are the insights, the evidence that people can gain via macroeconomic modeling. When we look around, actually not many of those models exist that have an explicit feature on resources. And indeed, John's is an exception. But if you compare it with the world of energy systems modeling that has been around for decades. The world of resource modeling is actually much, much smaller. And one of the first few efforts has been done by the OECD actually quite recently in the attempt to come up with a global material outlook for the year 2016, when they said that actually the world is going to triple the resource demand based on the expected economic growth rate in a number of countries. And a similar perspective, but with a different model, has been done by UNEP's International Resource Panel. So these are but two examples of how the macroeconomic modeling approaches are coupled with insights taken from material flow account. And in the UK, of course, the Office for, for, for Budget Responsibility 
uses also a macroeconomic model, though sadly, there's just nothing in it yet on materials or on circularity. So what the modelers then do is that they use a variety of data sources, uh, quite often from official statistics. They have typically grounding in monetary data, and then they use and apply econometric calibrations of the input coefficients. So how much steel goes into automotive production, etc. So that requires then data for product groups and uh, for industrial sectors. But the key indeed is that any such monetary value needs to be underpinned with real physical data for which some databases exist. We have been using the Exiobase approach. There's also the global material database that is provided by international resource panel. And uh, indeed it's been done by other researchers. Uh, so you would need to have the materials represented, possibly fine grained down to a very single material approach. But for a number of reasons, you can imagine that typically more aggregated material data are being, uh, being used. But I would also like to make the point here right at the beginning that data on energy itself won't be sufficient. And that is indeed something that we have seen in the past when the material databases need to be built up. Um, and indeed, with that sort of general picture, you would then be able to integrate also more detailed sectorial data. Think about the centers here with data on cement, on steel, on textiles, etc. cetera. Um, so the basic difference probably is that in the macroeconomic modeling world, there's just more macroeconomics in it. And when you do material, um, when you do the sort of input output analysis, you probably have a good touch on economic modeling, but just strong emphasis on the uh, material side. I'm happy to discuss with John and with you what the pros and cons of the different approaches are and how they can be combined. Um, so what are some of the measurement approaches and challenges? Let me just take a look with you together at this picture that I'm sure uh, many of you have seen already. So it's based on the material flow accounts that we have seen in such an impressive manner by John. But what researchers have started to do is that they measure the reuse, which is the input of secondary materials back into the economy. And that is called the material circularity rate in the EU's indicator scheme. There have been some measurements and indeed, the insight has been that the world economy is below 10% circular. In the EU, it is slightly better on average. And the UK is slightly better in those statistical terms with a rate of 16% roundabout. That means there is still a lot to go, but it's also a permanent challenge to represent the fluctuating volatile monetary data about say the market value of certain sectors that goes up and down according to market forces and link it with the physical accounts. What you then typically try to do is that you have the material specific coefficients for the industrial sectors. And in order to establish a, a secondary uh, reuse, a secondary uh, market, you often have to split the sectors because otherwise you would have to model within a sector. And that could be very challenging. What you then do as a next step is that you engage in scenario development for future changes in policy. The carbon border tax adjustment has been mentioned, but indeed there have also been modeling attempts on the aggregate taxation or what happens if a internationally applied construction material tax would be enacted or the same for a sort of an RMC type of a tax material input tax. So this all is something that can potentially be modeled. The challenge indeed would then go further if we integrated more legally oriented or information based instruments such as extended producer responsibility and then put the scenario development that comes with policy assumptions into technology coefficients and new input coefficients for this modeling world. So you can imagine that each of those steps requires quite detailed additional analysis.
On the macroeconomic level, what is important, when we look at the world economy, that in the future we would expect some countries to separate in their demand for materials due to infrastructure being set up. That is something you can imagine for China, for instance, with rapid growth rates over the last uh, 20 years. And indeed, you can make some calculation on how the saturation effect can be taken into account. The same goes for kind of an autonomous decoupling rate. Um, and indeed, in some of the work that has been done, you also see that if any tax is developed, the use of the revenues also matters quite a lot. A question that comes up often is about rebound effects. Can they be assessed, yes or no? I would say some can, like what happens with international trade, if you have a national measure, but indeed this generates exports rather than reduces the overall consumption. So those effects can be done, in particular if you have a sort of international trade-based models like we have. The real challenge is to model the the disruptive, the transformative changes that we all hope to see in the near-term future. That would require uh, or goes against the tendency of having the elasticities calculated econometrically, which is, they have been based on past experience rather than on expected disruptive futures. Um, well, there have been a couple of studies done in the past. The GinForce model um, uh, that is um, managed by Osnabrück colleagues, they did some good studies about possible reduction in RMC, for instance, like a 50% reduction feasible according to their model, plus some moderate increase in GDP. There also has been the study done by Cambridge Econometrics back then, with a number coming up of 2 million additional jobs expected that was quite essential in shaping the European Commission's climate action package back then, five years ago. And indeed a number of studies you probably all have seen um, published by the Al MacArthur Foundation about investment opportunities, etc. So the bottom line here probably is that they all have had quite some impact politically, but indeed these are the numbers that also attract people outside the community because they speak more to the world of like uh, economic policy, industrial policy, or like, 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 like investments. So what are we doing? We have set up a, um, a general equilibrium model a while ago, um, and we have made all the environmental extensions that are necessary for the purposes here. So it's a multi-region, multi-sector dynamic CGE model. It's based on what is called the GTEP, the Global Trade Analysis Project, a database, and it is extended with a number of uh, material accounts in particular. We have represented 25 regions, 25 sectors, four factors of production in our uh, model. And we are in particularly well developed in terms of the steel uh, cycle, which is indeed also why we are so interested in the circular metals uh, center here. Uh, we have the are done the sectoral split to have um, separate accounts for the scrap treatment and recycling sector, uh, which is something that I can show you here. We have done some analysis on China, the largest steel producer with quite ambitious circular economy plans. What would happen in China and in the world economy if China shifted towards a 50% reuse rate for a secondary steel in the near term future. And we figured out that indeed you can do some sectorial changes and assume a different elasticity in those sectors. And the end story would be again in China, despite indeed losses in the primary steel production sector. And we figured out that the majority of the developing world would have lower cost for setting up their infrastructure and, uh, and, 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 and steel consumption. Uh, so they would gain with some uh, benefits for the SDG implementation, except indeed the Brazil's Australia of the world were basically like iron ore exporters. Um, 
We also have CO2 emissions in our model, like others, but indeed then you need to have quite a detailed assumptions about how the electricity mix changes over the next years, which makes it a bit more difficult, but it is an essential exercise. So this is just a flavor of the work that we have been done in the past and also indicates a bit the sort of line of thinking here. Are we alone with our CG modeling tool? Absolutely not. There's a basic paradigm debate between the uh, equilibrium world and the non-equilibrium world. Um, you would imagine that economists have quite a fierce debate internally, but it's also something that is, say, uh, around in terms of how transformations work. Uh, the neo keynesian word is a non-equilibrium word. It's more like Schumpeterian, driven by demand-led and investment-driven innovation that can be quite fundamental. Um, and you see like below a bit the um, um, pictures that would explain from a neo keynesian perspective how the differences are. The interesting story is that despite the differences in say the modeling philosophy, you quite often have similar uh, outcomes in the long run and differences over the next few years, which has a lot to do with how multipliers are treated in the models and whether you assume we are currently in an equilibrium and how it would work in the future. Happy to discuss. What would be our next steps? So we've just released the report with HSBC, but we have to do a lot of work to update our database. We need to start the work on aluminium. We're going to develop low carbon pathways for steel industry and process energy in there. And we collaborate with RAP on the export of used vehicles, which we find interesting for the material leakage. And indeed also collaborate with other work packages in our sector to then ultimately develop a roadmap for steel and what are the economic impacts for the UK, but also for the international scene. Um, what I would like to discuss, and it's really just an invitation, uh, how the cross fertilizations across the centers could work, us being part in two of the centers, but indeed there are three others, there's a hub, there are other models around what practical steps we could undertake. I would also re emphasize the net zero carbon policy urgency from a global perspective. We would assume, and I hope you would agree, that there is no point in just having advantages for the UK. On the emission side, it needs to be uh, including the embodied emissions and uh, take into account a global reduction of those emissions. And what we would really like to do, and I think that is the opportunity here over the next two or three years, is that we could map key innovations for a circular economy and then translate them into sectorial coefficients for the input into models like ours and uh, then indeed also understand better the more granular transition pathways here. So that is something that I think we have an opportunity to achieve. I really look forward to it. We could also then together try to develop at least elements of a circular economy roadmap and indeed also then agree on some of the suggested key policies here so that ultimately in the next two, three years, we could come much closer to deliver a proper economic impact assessment about the circular economy, the size of the cake in the UK. I'm stopping here. There are also some references. Thanks a lot. I see Peter returning on screen, probably silently reminding me that my time is over. So thanks yes. a lot. I look forward to perhaps a quick discussion. Thanks, Raymond. Yes, I did. Uh, I did do that. So, and you'll realise I've put a jumper on uh, as the temperature plummets here. So, uh, I'm not allowed to have the gas on, um, the gas heating, uh, and, and, until the end of November. So, thanks. Um, I, I did remind people that there will be an exam paper at the end of this um, this uh, event. Uh, and Raymond, you've given us a a quick run through the complexity of uh, macroeconomic models, although what, how you present it was very elegant and interesting. And I think it reminds us <clears throat> that one of the aims of the NICER program is to improve the evidence base for some of the claims made around the circular economy about not only what is it, uh, 
but what can it contribute to jobs? What, what does it mean for investment? Uh, what are the economic uh, outcomes? Um, so I, I can see a lot of complementarity between the work you've presented, that John's presented, that Marcus has presented. Um, there's just a couple of um, a couple of um, questions uh, that have come in. I, I would love to move on to Andy shortly, uh, and I'm just finding my uh, link here. So I think it's Sophia. I think was was I think she was picking up your your point earlier on about secondhand materials or re reused materials crossing sectors, e.g., between. The food industry and automotive can it was was that a point you made um raymond and how how does that get handled in a um in 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 your work so in the case of steel for example it can go re return to a number of different sectors you know what, what what's the implications of that um it is um extremely important what we can figure out indeed is as much as based on our work but the high rate of exports of scrap steel, while there is an underutilized ability in the UK to work with such scrap steel. Um, and uh, the barriers are partly skills, knowledge gaps. So we would like to develop uh, more broadly in our center, a roadmap on how we can capture more of this value and some of the implication it has for uh, reskilling labor and for the range of steel clusters across the UK. And you can imagine that is not work that we do alone, but across our center, this Warwick University, Brunel University, and I'd be delighted to also collaborate with others on this. What we will look at is, what does it mean then also for the international economy? If there's less scrap available or eventually more, if say China moved more strongly to uh, capturing scrap and, and uh, using the expected demolition of some of the infrastructure over the next few years. Great. Okay. So if I did ask a second question, but I'm going to move on. Uh, if, we, if we've got time uh, towards the, the end of the session this afternoon, we'll come back to the skill uh, agenda. But Mike's asked a question, Mike Trigan, is circularity better served by a more collaborative economic model, perhaps moving towards a global governance model? And I know you've written about global government governance in an article in Nature, Raymond. So do you want to say something about that? Is uh, where, 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 where does global um, collab collaborative uh, economics uh, in the work that you do? Um, it is to me uh, quite essential to underline the advantages of collaboration. It comes also with all the networks that are required along supply chains, but also across supply chains. It's not like inherent in our model, but it's a strong uh, part of all the scenarios that we are developing. It would also involve uh, partnerships between countries and partnership along supply chains. So uh, commitments made by automotive producers to have a higher share of uh, secondary uh, metals, for instance. Great, and I'm going to fit one more in. I, I, I will pick up the other questions in, in a later discussion if you're still um, willing to uh, stay on online, Raymond, until the end. But um, there's a question here from uh, Faya about illegal and informal material flows that might, might not be represented in, in, in accounts, especially commodities um, that, that might not be um, uh, fully accounted for. So. She refers to, you know, timber and sand covered mm -hmm. in material flow analysis and macroeconomic modelling. So I assume that means mm -hmm. illegal logging, the way that um, sand is mined in, in Africa and elsewhere, which might not be um, uh, reported uh, to, to the national accounts. Uh, yes, that's a uh, correct point. But I did some analysis on Coltane, international trade, thinking that probably it then comes up in the import statistics of other countries that yes, there it is. So we really have like inconsistency across statistics and indeed it requires quite some time to figure out what that means and to then come to an estimate whether this comes closer to a full picture or not. So I would think that in particular with commodities like sand, like timber that have a market value that you see it then coming up in the production statistic of the country because they will need the inputs of those materials. And then you can trace it back to the import statistic. And at a certain point in time, it needs to come up. So that is a sort of 
interesting angle, and indeed you would not automatically trust in a country that is, say, known for supporting illegal practices, comes up with an export statistic that just looks uh, strange. Okay, great. I've made a note of questions from Sat, mm. Hong and Andy. So I'm going to move back to Fiona, though, who's going to introduce um, Andy Reese. So uh, Fiona, over to you. Raymond, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.